The big question: How can water, ice, and vapor be the same thing? Meet a Cheroraptor timurtiorum, Doctor Forrester said, gesturing down at the dark fossils embedded in the pale rock at their feet. He lived in this part of North America about sixty-six million years ago. Along with other dinosaurs such as Tyrannosaurus and Triceratops, Tess and I call him Achy Breaky for short. Achy for the first part of his scientific name, Acheroraptor, and Breaky because some of his fossil bones are broken up into pieces. No kidding, thought Amy. She had expected the dinosaur skeleton to be nicely laid out like those she'd seen in museums. Instead, different fossil bones were angled this way and that, like a jumble of large and small puzzle pieces. She edged further into the square of shade cast by the blue plastic tarp that had been strung over the dig site. It was situated on a narrow plateau about halfway up a rocky ridge, completely exposed to the blazing afternoon sun. Julian pulled out a rock hammer and a small chisel from his cloth bag. So, do we use these to chip the fossils out of the rock? Doctor Forrester shook her head. Paleontologists use a hammer and chisel to break apart big chunks of rock, or in places where there's no chance of damaging fossil bones. Once fossils are partially exposed, like they are here. We switched to smaller tools designed for more delicate work. She held up a slim metal pick and a small paintbrush. In your tool bags, you'll find a pick like this for scraping away rock and a brush to whisk the rock dust away. Doctor Forrester and I will demonstrate how to use these tools correctly on this leg bone we're working on. Tess explained, kneeling beside a long, narrow fossil. Please listen and watch closely. She and Doctor Forrester used their picks to scrape and scratch at the rock where it met the fossil. This rock is a type of sandstone and quite soft and crumbly. Excavating fossils like this is time-consuming but not particularly difficult. It just takes patience, Doctor Forrester said. She used her brush to gently clean the area where she'd been working. Every few minutes, use your brush like this to clear away the rock dust, so you can see what you're doing. She added. Amy and the other campers watched intently for a few minutes. Then it was their turn. Working with a partner, Doctor Forrester instructed, Tess and I want you to choose a bone that you'd like to excavate together. Tess and I will work with you to make sure you're getting the hang of it. Amy followed Matt, who made a beeline for the dinosaur's jawbone at the far edge of the dig site. Julian and Crystal chose bones that Doctor Forrester said were part of a foot, while Felix and Daria settled on a short chain of bones that were unmistakably part of the dinosaur's backbone. Matt began using his pick to very carefully scrape away the rock around one of the teeth that were embedded in the jawbone. These teeth still look sharp! He exclaimed. Amy ran a finger around the bony edge at the back of the jawbone. It seemed as good a place to start as any, so she got out her tools and set to work. Doctor Forrester and Tess came around every so often. And checked how everyone was doing. When they were confident that all the campers had the technique down, they worked together on the leg bone. For more than two hours, the only sounds were the scratch of picks and the swish of brushes, the buzz of flies, and the wind sighing through the dry grasses that grew along the edge of the plateau. Julian broke the silence by asking what Amy thought was a strange question. Doctor Forrester, if I wanted to be a famous paleontologist, what would I need to do? She considered the question for a minute. Well, finding a new type or species of dinosaur might make you famous, at least among other paleontologists. 
But there's a lot of luck involved in fossil discoveries, Julian. And really important discoveries are few and far between. I'm afraid you can't just set out to become famous and expect it to happen. Julian frowned. My dad's famous. He owns four restaurants in Dallas. And my brother is famous too because he plays football for a big university team. If we discover something new, I sure hope I'm the one to find it. Dr. Forrester didn't seem to know what to say, but Felix had perked up at the mention of restaurants. Speaking of food, he said, is there anything to eat? Excavating fossils is hungry work. Let's take a break, Tess offered, and led them to the far end of the plateau where the ridge formed a wall high enough to create a patch of shade. Everyone sat with their backs against the rock wall and stretched their legs out in front of them as Tess passed out bottles of water and energy bars from the cooler. Felix devoured one bar and started on another before anyone else had taken a bite. Amy wondered if he was always so hungry. Munching slowly, Daria pulled out her phone and then frowned down at the screen. No signal here either. The cell coverage is pretty spotty, Dr. Forrester explained, so I'm afraid cell phones are fairly useless out here. It's no big deal, Daria said quickly. I just miss my mom. I mean, I was just wondering what my friends are doing right now, that's all. She slipped her phone back into her pocket. Julian helped himself to another bottle of water from the cooler. The ice is melting fast in this heat. A good example of chemistry in action, Tess said. Chemistry, Felix mumbled, swallowing the last bite of his third energy bar. What does melting ice have to do with chemistry? Remember that chemistry is the study of matter and how it changes, Tess said. Solid ice melting to liquid water is an example of a physical change in matter, in which matter changes from one state to another. Ice is water in its solid state. When ice melts, water undergoes a physical change, going from a solid state to a liquid state. Tess gestured toward the ice chest. Suppose we poured that water out on the ground here. What do you think would happen to it? Crystal raised her hand hesitantly. The water would gradually dry up and disappear like rain on the pavement does when the sun comes out. Well, it might seem like it is disappearing, Tess replied, but matter can't be created or destroyed. The water would slowly change states again, this time changing from a liquid to an invisible gas called water vapor that floats up into the air. You mean it evaporates, Amy offered. Yes, that's the term, Tess replied. A similar change in state from liquid to gas takes place when water boils. So if ice, water, and water vapor are all the same kind of matter, what explains the different states, Matt asked. Excellent question, Matt, Tess replied. All matter is made up of small particles so small that they can't be seen with the naked eye. Whether a type of matter is in a solid, liquid, or gaseous state depends on how tightly packed these particles are and how much energy they have. In a solid, such as an ice cube, the particles are crammed together. They can wiggle, but they don't have enough energy to do much more than that. A solid keeps its shape because its particles are in such fixed positions. Tess took a sip of water from her bottle. Matter in liquid form, like the water in this bottle, has particles that are farther apart than those in a solid. They have more energy, too, enough so they move freely and slip and slide past each other. That's why liquids flow. Matter in a liquid state doesn't have a fixed shape. It takes the shape of whatever space it occupies. She held up her bottle and tipped it from side to side. Matter in gaseous form, Tess continued, 
is made up of particles that are farther apart than those in a liquid, and much farther apart than particles in a solid, and they have more energy too. There is so much space between gas particles that they move very freely and rapidly in different directions. A gas spreads out to fill whatever space is available. Tess spread her arms wide, and here in Montana we have lots of space. Julian scooped up a handful of the cold water in the bottom of the cooler and splashed it onto his face. So my question is, how do we get more ice? I'm not too keen on drinking warm water. Fortunately, physical changes in matter are reversible. Doctor Forrester chimed in. Matter changes state when heat is added or taken away. For example, ice melts as it gets warm. Chill that water down by removing heat, and it turns back into ice. That's what our portable, battery-powered refrigerator back at camp can do. It keeps our food cold and even makes ice. She glanced at her watch. How about we work for another half hour or so, and then head back to camp for dinner? Dinner! Yes! Felix cried, pumping his fist in the air. But you just ate three energy bars, Daria said, looking amazed. That was nothing, Felix replied, because in a half hour I'll most certainly be starving again. My mom says I burn calories really fast because I never sit still. He leaped up and started doing a little dance along the edge of the plateau. It seemed to Amy that what happened next unfolded in slow motion. Just as Doctor Forrester called out for Felix to be careful, part of the rock ledge where he was dancing gave way. Felix swayed, trying to keep his balance. His eyes grew wide, and in the next instant, he was gone. Everyone scrambled to the edge and looked down. Felix was sitting at the bottom of the gully, about ten feet below, with a surprised expression on his face. Doctor Forrester's face was dark with worry. Felix, are you all right? Felix jumped to his feet and started dusting himself off. I'm fine, he called up, grinning. I didn't really fall. I just scooted down on my backside. He started to climb the slope, but paused to pick something up from the gravelly bottom of the gully. What do you make of this, Doctor Forrester? He asked when he was back on the plateau. He held up what looked to Amy like a dark oblong rock. Doctor Forrester gripped him by the shoulders. Never do anything like that again, she said sternly. You could have been hurt. Then she looked carefully at Felix's find. It's definitely a piece of fossil bone, she said slowly, turning it over and over in her hands. She nodded toward the gully. I think I'll hike down there and have a quick look around. Fifteen minutes later, she was back with several more small fossil fragments. Everyone gathered around as she laid them out on the ground. What kind of animal are they from? Crystal asked, pulling out her sketchbook and beginning to make drawings of the bones. Doctor Forrester shook her head. I won't really know until I've looked at them more closely. Let's pack up our gear and head back. Back at camp, Amy and Julian helped Tess make spaghetti in the tent that served as a kitchen. When dinner was ready, everyone gathered around a table set up outside. Tess went to the lab to get Doctor Forrester, but she came back alone. Doctor Forrester says she'll eat later after she's done studying those little bones. The sun set while they were eating, and a cool breeze sprang up. When they had finished dinner, Crystal and Matt did the dishes, and Tess built a huge campfire with thick chunks of wood. Everyone gathered around the fire, and Amy was surprised how good the heat from the flames felt as the temperature kept dropping. Suddenly, the fire popped, and sparks shot up into the air. Whoa! Daria said, scooting back a few feet. I think a log just exploded. 
It did because water changed states, Tess said quietly. What chemistry again, Felix teased. Tess just smiled. Logs often have small pockets of water and sap in them. As the logs start to burn, the liquid gets hot enough to boil and changes states to become a gas. But the gas is trapped inside the log. Pressure builds as the gas gets hotter until at some point the wood gives way with a pop and the hot gas escapes. Just then they heard footsteps and Dr. Forrester appeared in the firelight. Those little fossil bones are very interesting, she said. I'm thinking they might belong to a small dinosaur rather than an ancient mammal or bird, but unfortunately I don't have enough pieces yet to be sure. I want to look at them, Julian said, jumping up from his chair and heading for the lab. Dr. Forrester caught him by the shoulder. If you don't mind, Julian, let's wait until morning. It's really time for everyone to head for bed. Julian shrugged and reluctantly said, Okay. As Amy walked with Crystal and Daria to their tent, she suddenly remembered the snakes. Were snakes coming out of their daylight hiding places now that it was cooler? With one eye peeled for anything slithery, Amy brushed her teeth with water in a cup and spat the minty foam onto a rock beside the tent. Then she checked to make sure there was nothing in her sleeping bag before crawling inside. Daria and Crystal were quickly asleep, but Amy lay stiffly on her cot, listening for rustling sounds. Finally, she got up and shone her flashlight into every corner of the tent, under all the cots, and then zipped up the tent flap. She was pretty sure there was no other way for snakes to get in. Even then, though, sleep refused to come. Amy flicked on her flashlight and pulled out one of the books she had brought along, The Mystery of the Old Masters. She had read the book many times, but she never tired of reading how Inspector Ellis figured out who'd stolen the priceless paintings. She thought it was clever the way Inspector kept track of clues on a small notepad and consulted this list often. After finishing the first chapter, Amy felt better. She just wished that instead of fossil camp, she could have gone to detective camp, if there was such a thing.